Well, good evening and welcome to Bible Study Live. I'm Pastor Jonathan Hart with Robert Stowe UMC, and we are here in person in the Fellowship Hall and also with you online via our Facebook page. Uh, and we're also embedding this Facebook Live video to our church website so that you can tune in uh, and watch us in either location. Uh, I'm going to take a minute before we get started. Tonight is week seven of the Songs of Ascents, which are uh, Psalms 120 through 134, the Psalms that Jews would sing on their way up to Jerusalem for the annual feasts and festivals. And tonight we're going to look at Psalm 130 and Psalm 131. If you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bible, uh, or if you have a smart device and you want to pull up a tab, uh, you can look it up and follow along because we'll be talking about both of these passages in detail tonight. I'm going to do what I've done each week, and that is read each psalm, uh, first in the NIV, and then in Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. We're going to read those translations back to back uh, to see how they sound against one another, maybe help illuminate the meaning of the psalm as we hear how they're put in two different ways. Uh, but before we get into the first psalm, I'm going to take a moment to share this to my own Facebook timeline, and I would appreciate you doing likewise. Uh, that way we can increase engagement, invite others to participate with us, whether that's live right here uh, during this hour or after the fact uh, when people watch it later. So I'm going to share that and make it public, and I think it worked. All right. So uh, welcome again. My name is Pastor Jonathan, and uh, I'm just grateful that we can gather for Bible study in this way. Uh, I was talking to my friend Susan, uh, who's not my only friend, nor my only friend named Susan. So I thank God for that tonight, that I, I have multiple friends named Susan. Uh, but we were talking about how uh, this, this online Bible study format has really been since about March 19th. Uh, each Wednesday night gathering online for Bible study. All of those videos are there on our Facebook page, also on our YouTube channel, uh, and at our website, robertsdaleumc.com forward slash live, where you can see when we go live, but also all the videos are archived uh, below that. So tonight we're going to continue this discipleship journey, and we're looking at the Psalms as a way of grounding us in the richness of the Old Testament and what it means to be part of the pilgrim people of God, but also as New Testament followers of Jesus, uh, how these teach us about the continued life of discipleship as we follow Him. So Psalm 130 uh, is a song of ascents, like all of these, and uh, Psalm 131 begins with the word, a song of ascents of David. So we know specifically that the second one we're going to look at tonight was written by King David. But Psalm 130, a song of ascents, I'm going to go ahead and read this in the NIV, and then I'm going to go right into reading it in the message, read the two translations back to back, uh, and then we're going to try to talk about what it means a little bit. So here we go. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and his word, in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. So I want to just pause, and I wonder what words or phrases might have just lit up in your ears or emboldened in your mind as you heard that psalm read. And these words are going to be a little bit different because this second one, uh, it's not only a different translation, it's really more of a paraphrase as, you, as Eugene Peterson uh, tries to put the meaning of the psalm uh, in his own words as he translated this for the people of his own congregation in Maryland. Um, but this is Psalm 130 again in the message. Help, God, the bottom has fallen out of my life. Master, hear my cry for help. Listen hard. Open your ears. Listen to my cries for mercy. If you, God, kept records on wrongdoings, who would stand a chance? As it turns out, forgiveness is your habit, and that's why you're worshipped. I pray to God, my life a prayer, and wait for what he'll say and do. My life's on the line before God, my Lord, waiting and watching till morning, waiting and watching till morning. O Israel, wait and watch for God. With God's arrival comes love. With God's arrival comes generous redemption. No doubt about it, he'll redeem Israel, buy back Israel from captivity to sin. 
So I wonder what words or phrases might have popped up for you out of that translation, and I wonder uh, where there might have been some overlap for you that you noticed uh, getting at the same meaning uh, that was really emphasized for you, maybe that your mind or your heart honed in on as those two translations were read back to back. The word that Eugene Peterson uh, really comes to in understanding this psalm also as a a picture for us of discipleship or the step that we take in Christ and following him is the word hope. Uh, And and I'll give you a little teaser. Uh, Both of these psalms really deal with hope tonight. Uh, Psalm 130 and 131. Uh, In fact, the word hope, uh, I believe, is in both of them. Yep, it is. Um, But he really hones in on hope out of all the songs of ascents. This is the one he says is most about hope. And the reason you can hear in the language is because the psalm is about waiting. The the psalmist is crying out for help. That's the beginning of the psalm. So we've looked at a lot of different songs. This is week seven. uh, And for a while, we've actually been doing two a week. So we've looked at many of these now. Uh, This is Psalm 130 out of uh, 15. We started with Psalm 120. So this is the 11th psalm we've looked at. And uh, out of 15, and he, he, some of the psalms are more jubilant. They're more celebratory. Uh, but this one is also celebratory, isn't it? Because when it gets to the end, it talks about how Israel should put our hope in the Lord. Uh, that with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption, and he himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. But it's a far off kind of thing. Uh, and the reason I'm excited about talking about this tonight is because I don't know about you, but I think all of us feel in 2020... Like the sooner this year can be over, the better. And I'm hearing about so many people that are already putting their Christmas trees up because they just can't wait till after Thanksgiving. (laughs) Susan's shaking her head like, I'm not there yet. But I know others who are because we're already leaning. It's, It's almost like we're leaning into the end of this year because we can't wait for a new year to begin, right? We can't wait for a fresh start. That's the posture of this psalm. Uh, that he's crying out for help. He's in the midst of a 2020 kind of situation, whether, you know, whether it's a pandemic virus, who knows what the psalmist is going through when he writes these words. But he says, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Um, And then he talks about his own undeservedness for that mercy. Notice that. If you, Lord, keep a record of sins, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. So again, celebrating who God is so that we can with reverence serve you. And then this paragraph that really captures the meaning of the song, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. In his word, I put my hope, I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. And this is the one line that's repeated, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Eugene Peterson uh, translates that in his own way. My life's on the line before God, waiting and watching till morning. So uh, there's this picture, right, of waiting on God. And we're coming up on the season of Advent, which for us in the Christian calendar starts on November 29th, and it's the four weeks leading up to Christmas. And Advent is that season of waiting and anticipating uh, what Christmas will be when it arrives, the coming of God's promise, which for us is completely fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, the coming of Christ. So we celebrate his arrival. We celebrate the arrival of God in the flesh and the hopes of all the years amidst all the fears and anxieties. Um, And as we tell the Christmas story, I think as, as I hear the story year after year, one thing that I come more in contact with in the story, the, the thing that becomes more present to me is the original sense of anxiety and busyness in the story. Like I find myself in the places and with the characters going, this was not just a silent holy night, right, of peace uh, and animals cooing and all, isn't the baby Jesus cute? Uh, It was full of angst and anxiety and a census and uh, political and military figures that were anxious about their own need to keep power and all this stuff was going on and God enters right in the midst of it. And that's kind of the tone of this psalm. Uh, And that's why it's so beautiful to understand the richness of these psalms and how Jesus uh, fulfills uh, the groundwork that's laid there. Eugene Peterson says about uh, our culture that it's difficult to find anyone in our culture who will respect us when we suffer. And this psalm begins by anchoring us in the place of suffering. Uh, We live in a time when everyone's goal is to be perpetually healthy, constantly happy, and if any one of us fails to live up to the standards that are advertised as normative, we're labeled as a problem to be solved. 
Uh, and that's something about his writing that's really impacted me is it's convicting to ask myself, am I seeing people as complex organisms that are at a certain place on a journey and I have the privilege of stepping uh, along with them on that journey or am I viewing people as problems to be solved because of my own anxious need for the solution and resolution of whatever is manifesting in the person in front of me, right? Uh, a host of well-intentioned people, he writes, will rush to try and uh, try various cures on us, or we're looked at as an, enig an enigma to be unraveled, in which case we're subjected to endless discussions, our lives examined by researchers, zealous for the clue that will account for our lack of health or happiness. <laughs> so basically, if someone is not perpetually healthy or constantly happy, then we've got to get to the bottom of that because we just can't stand it, right? We need everything to be okay. And part of the Christian life and part of the, the journey of the pilgrim on the path to God is, God, how can I be okay when all around me things are not okay? And that's where this psalm is. And part of the message, though we don't necessarily want this to be the answer to that question, is wait and hope that in the midst when things are not okay, it's not just a quick and easy answer our faith gives us and our belief about who God is in Jesus uh, gives us. It's not just a quick and easy, and it never has been. Part of the answer is, I will teach you to wait. I will teach you how to have hope even before the resolution, even before the promise. Um, years and years, hundreds of years, Israel had to wait through seasons of their history, right? This is the origin of our faith. This, for many of us, uh, we become grafted in as Gentiles when we put our faith in Christ. But when we read the backstory, we realize, man, we are a waiting people. Uh, and even as people who now look back on the first advent, the first coming of Christ, we have to be a waiting people who live in between the first coming and the second. And even now, as we long for Jesus to come back again, the second advent, the return of Christ, when God will finish his work of putting all things to right. So far, it's been over 2,000 years. And who knows how much longer it will be. Now, I know some of you are watching this going, well, it can't be much longer because I just can't stomach. And I'm with you. However, we are a people who are trained by God to wait. That's part of our journey. That's part of our spiritual growth. That's part of our discipleship uh, course that we are on with the Lord. Israel teaches us to respond to suffering as reality, not deny it as an illusion. Uh, it leads us to face it with faith, not avoid it out of fear. So suffering isn't just something we avoid. However, we also don't just celebrate suffering. We don't just make a religion out of it. We're not masochists who think that we're being holy only when we're hurting. Uh, that's not necessarily the gospel. Uh, we don't just think personal misery is a sign of exceptional righteousness so that the more miserable we are and the more suffering we are, uh, it must be the more holy we are. There is some suffering in which we get involved that is useless and unnecessary and that God wants to heal us from, call us away from, lead us out of. Uh, but there's adequate common sense wisdom, Eugene Peterson says, in Christian ways uh, which prevents us from suffering for the wrong reasons. And there's the key. Because the Christian life is not promised to be one without suffering. The key is knowing when to suffer and suffering for the right reasons. Uh, and that if there are reasons we are suffering unnecessarily because we're walking in a way that God wants to deliver us from, then we need to follow Him out of that place. Uh, there's a, a, a Catholic writer named Henry Nouwen. Uh, it's not quite how you say his name, but Henri Nouwen. And he wrote, uh, Many people suffer because of the false supposition on which they've based their lives. The supposition is that there should be no fear or loneliness, no confusion or doubt. But these sufferings can only be dealt with creatively when they're understood as wounds integral to our human condition. Therefore, ministry is a very confronting service, he says. Uh, so when we're in ministry, and I don't just mean vocational ministers uh, or full-time paid people in ministry or people who work in church. I mean all of us who are in ministry as Christ representatives in the world. Uh, we are a confronting people. We confront our own and help others confront their own loneliness, brokenness, fear, confusion, doubt. It does not allow people to live with illusions of immortality and wholeness. <laughs> it keeps reminding others that they are mortal and broken, but also that with the recognition of this condition, liberation can finally start. 
when we recognize that we're not immortal, we're not whole yet, that God designed us to be that way, but all of us are mortal and all of us are broken, then we can finally start moving toward liberation. I want to share one more quote. That was from Henry, Henry Now and George MacDonald put it uh, with uh, Henry, uh, uh, Eugene Peterson says, excuse me, with epigrammatic force. I'm not even sure I know what that means. Uh, the Son of God, George MacDonald writes, the Son of God suffered unto death not that men might not suffer, but that their sufferings might be like his. I'm just going to let that quote sink in for a minute. God sent his son to suffer even to the point of death. Not that we would not suffer, but so that we could learn to let our suffering be like his. Uh, so that our suffering could take on the form of the suffering of Jesus. Jesus suffered for the right reasons. Jesus suffered in the right way. And so now, and this is what I love about uh, living as we do as people of the new covenant who now look back on the reality of the psalmist in Psalm 130, is that we now have this wonderful and vivid example of how to suffer and why to suffer and what it means to lay down our life for the sake of, of the other, what it means to be a person of faith in a culture of fear. Um, and, and we have this incredible hope because God has already made a down payment on it. Um, now, in the Old Testament, they had down, down payments, too. They would look back on God's delivering them through the exodus uh, from slavery to Egypt. We look back on the exodus of Jesus delivering us from slavery to sin and death. Uh, they looked back on God giving them a promised land. We look back uh, on God sending his Holy Spirit so that wherever we are, God himself is right there with us in an, in an unmeasured, unlimited kind of way, present with us always. Um, such are the two great realities of Psalm 130, that suffering is real and that God is real. That's what the psalm teaches us. So we don't deny suffering. It's not an illusion. It's not something to be avoided. Uh, it is real, but so is God. And that is the gospel. Uh, the gospel is not just that suffering is real. You don't have to know God, believe in him or anything to acknowledge that reality. Uh, but our joint reality that changes the whole picture is that just as we live in a world of suffering, we also live in a world in which God is present with us and God is right there in the midst of the suffering. So we accept suffering, we believe in God. We accept suffering, we believe in God. Uh, and I love what Eugene Peterson says about how, what form that takes because to accept suffering and to believe in God is to be a hoping and waiting people. And he says that the psalm actually describes uh, the procedure for per participating in this reality uh, that suffering is real and God is real and it's a two-part program watch and wait watch and wait now right off the bat if you're like me you hear those words and you think that sounds incredibly passive right it sounds totally passive I mean what does a watchman do uh, Eugene Peterson in his book a long obedience in the same direction talks about when he was in college and he served as a night watchman he got paid uh, to just sit in a lobby all night. And he would doze off, he would read books, he would man the elevator, but that usually fizzled out around midnight. Uh, and someone thought it was worth paying him money for him just to sit in the lobby so that someone could be a watchman all night long uh, as, the, as the hotel or the apartment complex, whichever it was, uh, stayed open and people would come in and out. And he would see the world and the nightlife of the world and the city in which he was studying uh, pass by him every night and he got used to the rhythms and how this person would come and go at a certain amount of time but he was just a watchman he didn't control any of it he didn't do anything about it he watched it but but he writes hoping does not mean doing nothing uh, it's not a fatalistic resignation to just let life go on as is it means rather going about our assigned tasks confident that God will provide the meaning and the conclusions. It's, it's not a resignation, but it is a resigning of power and control. It's going about our assigned tasks, confident that God is the one who provides the meaning and the conclusions. It's also not dreaming. Uh, it's not spinning an illusion or a fantasy to protect us from our boredom or our pain in life. It means a confident, alert expectation that God is going to do what he said he will do. Uh, that's what hoping is. So when you and I are present in the world and we say, what does hope look like? It looks like us uh, being confident, being a person of confidence. And we're going to talk about this again in just a moment when we get into Psalm 131. 
being a person of confidence and alert expectation, not passive, boring resignation to nothing, but alert expectation. It's like we're, we're actively looking around for what God is doing because we expect him to do what he said he's going to do. And it's a willingness to let him do it his way and in his time. <laughs> that's part of what waiting and watching is about. Uh, and that's incredibly hard for not just some of us, but I would think all of us. So uh, when Eugene Peterson was translating this psalm, I don't know if you heard this language, but in the beginning when the psalmist is crying out for help, he says the bottom has fallen out. And he says one of the beautiful things about trusting God and becoming a person of hope even though we live in a world where suffering is real. When you live in a world where you learn that God is also real, you learn that the bottom has a bottom. That even when it feels like the bottom has fallen out, maybe the bottom was lower than you thought. Maybe you've had a, a time in your life where you thought you'd hit rock bottom, only to find out there was a lower rock bottom that you hit later. The bottom still has a bottom. It might be really, 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 really low, but it's limited. And what's not limited are the heights. That we live in a world where the bottom has a bottom, but the heights are boundless. And so we lift up our eyes and we gaze with expectant hope to the Lord at what he's doing around us and how he is moving us closer and closer every day, every moment toward the things he has said he was going to do. Um, so for all of us, for the person who has suffered or will suffer uh, Psalm 130 is essential because it convinces us that the big difference is not what people will suffer, but the way in which we will suffer. And it's amazing how we can respond to the same thing totally differently. Um, there's actually another uh, church father, St. Augustine, who wrote in the City of God. Uh, I love this quote, and I'm going to close with this, and then we'll go to Psalm 131. St. Augustine in the City of God said the same Shaking that makes fetid water stink makes perfume issue a more pleasant odor. <laughs> Do you get that? So basically, all of us are going to experience shakings in life. And it's amazing that the way in which we go through that suffering uh, decides whether there's going to be an odor uh, or a pleasant aroma. And so part of our faith is taking all of life and letting it be a pleasant aroma of praise to the Lord and how we live and how we hope and how we cling to Him. Uh, and I believe that goes right into the next Psalm, Psalm 131. So uh, we're shifting now from Psalm 130 to 131. This is a much shorter Psalm. It's only three verses. And again, I'm going to read it in the NIV and then the message. Psalm 131, a song of ascents of David. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. So you see why I said these psalms are both about hope, because it ends with hope. But the whole rest of the psalm, the, the other two-thirds, the other two verses out of the three, uh, are about humility. Uh, that's the word that Eugene Peterson uses because he says, my heart is not what? Proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. This is how Eugene Peterson takes that and puts it in his own words in the message. God, I'm not trying to rule the roost. I don't want to be king of the mountain. I haven't meddled where I have no business or fantasized grandiose plans. I have kept my feet on the ground. I've cultivated a quiet heart. Like a baby content in its mother's arms, my soul is a baby content. Wait, Israel, for God. Wait with hope. Hope now. Hope always. John Bailey, I think I'm saying his name right, once wrote, Humility is the obverse side of confidence in God, whereas pride is the obverse side of confidence in self. And I have to say, this is an area that I've been working on for a while. Uh, and when I say working on, I've asked people about this. I've researched about it. I've counseled with people, both for myself and people that I'm trying to provide with pastoral care. Because for the longest time, I've really struggled with the concepts of confidence, humility, uh, and what I would call um, self-abnegation or self-loathing even, um, pride, pride. Um, yeah, all that. And what I've discovered is that 
uh, pride and thinking too much of oneself and being arrogant and self-absorbed and self-consumed and, and even narcissistic to the point of where some people go in our time um, is actually the flip side of being self-loathing and thinking so little of yourself that you just want to be nothing. Um, and the reason is because both of those are actually fixated on the same thing, self. Whether you love yourself too much or you hate yourself too much, your focus is on self. And so oddly enough, and maybe you struggle with a piece of this or there's a, there's a part of your soul that resonates with what I'm saying, um, both of those are uh, actually a symptom of pride. And nobody would think that self-loathing would be a symptom of pride. But the antidote to both of those extremes is shifting the focus. It's not about loving or hating self. It's about focusing on God so that view of self comes into perspective. Does that make sense? I hope so. Uh, share in the comments, post a reaction, uh, ask a question. I would love to dialogue with you and I'll pull that up on my laptop so I can see. Uh, so again, the quote from John Bailey, humility is the obverse side of confidence in God, whereas pride is the obverse side of confidence in self. So humility is actually not about self-loathing or thinking too little of yourself. It's about thinking so much of God that, th that your view of self is always put in perspective. But notice that if you think uh, about God and your focus is on Him, you actually might think more of yourself. Because who are you in relation to God? Well, for one thing, you're his masterpiece. For another thing, you were made in his image. That he didn't just make you as an object or an invention of the creator. He made you as a creature bearing the mark and signature and even accent of the creator. Of all the animals in the kingdom, he placed you at the top. And he even shared his kingdom with you, asking you to co-rule it and be stewards of his good creation. You are made to be a daughter or a son of God, and I can think of no higher compliment. Jesus thinks you're worth dying for. So is all of this resulting in self-loathing or too little of you of yourself? No. It's to think very highly, not only of yourself, but every other human that comes across your path that you look at and realize is made in the image of God. But does that also result in humility? You better believe it. Because I'm not superior to anyone else. We are all made in the image of God. And the one that I don't think is even worth looking at or noticing or paying attention is just as worthy to God as I believe I am. It also makes me humble because I realize that I am not the creator. Uh, as, as much as I might be and you in the top of the hierarchy in the animal kingdom, we are infinitely under the Creator. This is incidentally why God gave Adam Eve. He said, he looked at Adam and said it was not good for man to be alone. But was man alone? No. Man had God, for one thing, the greatest relationship we were made for, right? But man also had the animals. And it, it said that Adam actually went through and named all the animals and looked at every animal, but then it says, but no suitable helper was found. So, when God said it's not good for man to be alone, what did he really mean? Well, he meant that here's man. God is above man. The other creatures are below man. And so the place where man is alone is the plane of equality. Adam needed another creature who was not superior or inferior to him. He needed an equal. He needed a partner. Uh, and this goes beyond just marriage, if that's what you're hearing in this. It, it means community in general. Humans are made to live in community with each other. Why? Because uh, God is never able to be reduced to less than community. God in himself. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We believe that the three are co-eternal. That God never existed. The Father never existed apart from the Son or the Spirit. And likewise, neither the Son nor Spirit existed apart from one another. So God has always enjoyed loving communion within himself. He's always known what it is to be an equal, loving, uh, mutually submitting relationship. Each one laying down self for the sake of the other. So to be made in his image means that we were actually made to experience the same thing. All right, that was deep. Let's take a breath. Ah. <sighs>
Wasn't that good though? That's so good. And if you've heard me say that like a thousand times, I apologize. It, it just lies deeply at the heart of my theology and it never gets old to me. But Eugene Peterson says that Psalm 131 is a maintenance psalm. It's functional to the person of faith the way that pruning is functional to the gardener. It gets rid of what looks good to those who don't know any better, and it reduces the distance between our hearts and the roots of our hearts in God. Uh, when you're pruning something, sometimes the farther away it gets from the roots, the bigger it grows, and therefore you think the more it should explode. But actually the blossoms might become puny or it might have a lot less blossoms because what, what it really needs is pruning. You have to get back closer to the roots where the nutrients are. And that's what he says this psalm does. It puts us back in proper perspective. It humbles us. It reminds us of our place. So two things he says that Psalm 131 prunes away are unruly ambition and infantile dependency. What he calls being too big for our britches or refusing to cut the apron strings. And that second one may not sound like a bad thing at all to you. Uh, but the psalmist cries out and basically says, uh, I'm not going to be too ambitious. I'm not going to think too highly of myself. At the same time, uh, we might think that we are to then be utterly codependent and infant, infantilely dependent upon God. When really that's not the goal of parenting a child, is it? The goal of parenting a child, uh, parenting a child is weaning. Not to completely cut off the relationship, but so that the child doesn't just look at, at the parent as a means to get what the child wants and needs, but that the child is able to enter into a loving relationship with the parent and just desires to be with the parent for sake of that relationship. Not just because I'm hungry and you're the only way I get fed. Does that make sense? And the same is true of God. So we live in a culture where there's this huge temptation uh, that especially in Western civilization, We've, we've treated ambition uh, with some special flourishes. Uh, we, we're surrounded by a way of life in which betterment is defined or understood by expansion or acquisition or fame. The bigger we can become, the more we can have, the more we can be known. All of this is what it means to be better. When in the kingdom of God, those aren't the economics of human betterment at all. Um, so the psalm cautions away from that, but it also cautions against the uh, way of being so dependent that we don't just enjoy God for God's sake and for our sake. It's difficult to recognize uh, these things when they're rewarded in culture or when they're so surrounding us that it's like being a fish in water. Um, Robert Browning once wrote a line, a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? I like that quote. Our reach should always exceed our grasp. Now, some of us need to hear the flip side of that, and that is, if your reach is always exceeding your grasp, that doesn't mean something's wrong. That doesn't just mean you're failing. That doesn't just mean you're never measuring up. That's the flip side of this, because humility uh, is both. Um, neither... Um, neither reaching for the skies and grabbing everything that's not nailed down uh, or, or neither giving up because you think you're just never going to get there because you're worthless. No, uh, heaven, part of being a citizen of heaven uh, is that it's always making us a better citizen of earth until we get there, <laughs> until we take up our permanent residency uh, where we were made to live forever. Does that make sense? I hope so. Uh, so the Lord actually gives us a picture of the child as a model for the Christian faith, right? You remember this from the Gospels? Uh, one example is Mark chapter 10, verses 14 and 16. Um, but he doesn't just give us that picture because of the child's helplessness, but rather because of the child's willingness to be led and to be taught and to be blessed. And that's an important one uh, because it actually takes humility to be blessed. You might think that's very strange. You remember how Peter reacted when Jesus tried to wash his feet? When Jesus wanted to bless his disciple, when he wanted to wash him, serve him, cleanse him, when he wanted to actually uh, elevate the disciple above himself, Peter could not stand to have a Lord, master, rabbi, teacher who would lower himself because he was just taught there's something wrong with that. But Jesus was teaching us that true, true humility uh, is not about not having the scepter. It's about setting the scepter down so that you can pick up a towel and basin 
and wash the feet of the person in front of you. What incredible humility, but also strength and confidence and security in your own identity. So it's, it's neither extreme, uh, getting your own security and being so focused on yourself that you do it for yourself, neither is it having no security at all. Those, those are the extremes that we live in. Both create anxiety, actually, because if I, if I get it for myself, then I have to keep it. And so I anxiously spend my whole life trying to keep what I've attained for myself. If I don't have it, then I'm anxious because I was actually made to have it. It's just that I have to find it in the Lord. And I have to be so confident, and again, going back to this living confidently with hope and waiting on the Lord, being so sure of God's presence in my life, and therefore my identity uh, in perspective to who He is, uh, that I am secure in that, even when other things around me are making me insecure. All that makes sense? I hope so. So I'm also going to close, uh, like I did with the last one, uh, with what Eugene Peterson writes about this psalm in conclusion, Psalm 131. Uh, but before I do that, I want to look real quick at the Facebook feed and comments. Uh, thank you to those who are, <laughs> thanks for positive comments. So many notes, good. Uh, and Wes, our youth and family director, is the one writing in the comment section. So Wes, thank you for keeping up with us and repeating stuff so that we can see it in writing and, and go over it and respond to it. Really appreciate that. Hello, Susan. Susan, it's our other friend, Susan. She's on here tonight. Hi, Susan. And hi, Joy. And hi, Naomi. Uh, and hey, everybody who's with us online, Denise and others, thank you for being with us. All right, so uh, here is what Eugene Peterson writes in conclusion about Psalm 131. And this is where we'll wrap up and I'll pray for us. Uh, it nurtures a quality of calm confidence and quiet strength. Do you remember that from reading? Uh, I know it's been a few minutes since we read the psalm together. But the psalmist says, I have, I have quieted myself. I have calmed myself. Uh, that is the antidote. And so it nurtures this quality of a calm confidence, not, not a, an insecure uh, passiveness, but a calm confidence and quiet strength that knows the difference between unruly arrogance and faithful aspiration, which is a good thing, knows how to discriminate between infantile dependency and childlike trust, and chooses to aspire and to trust and to sing, I've kept my feet on the ground, I've cultivated a quiet heart, like a baby content in its mother's arms, my soul is a baby content. What a great picture uh, of where to leave off tonight. We hope, uh, we remain humble, and if ever we need to know the stability, uh, the protection, the I know what's going on, don't worry, it'll be okay, I know you don't understand, I'm not even going to take the time to explain to you how this is all going to play out, just trust me. <laughs> It is now, right? So I would love to pray for us uh, as we wrap up our time tonight. God, thank you for everyone watching and listening and participating in Bible study, whether it's live or after the fact. Uh, I pray that these words, your word, would minister to our hearts in exactly the way we need tonight. That these psalms, these words of humility, these words of hope, these words of assurance would be words of conviction. Holy Spirit, that you would do your work of shining a flashlight in our souls. Show us the place where we need to embrace these truths, where we need to press in closer uh, in our walk with Jesus, to let you be our Lord so that we, uh, our own lives, our own choices, our own identities can be put in the right perspective. God, we do watch and wait for you. We renew our hope in you tonight, this week, this month, and even this year of all years, uh, we will not lose hope. We love you, we trust you, and we pray that you would be so real in our lives that those around us see you in and through us and can be blessed by your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you tonight. Thank you for being with us. This is Pastor Jonathan with Robert Stowe UMC. See you tomorrow for Daily Devo. Grace and peace.